welcome everyone to BDO's webinar on the Apprenticeship Levy. My name is Steph Wilson and I'm BDO's lead tax partner on the Apprenticeship Levy. For those of you who don't already know, BDO is a global accounting network with over 7 billion US dollars in revenues providing auditing, accounting and taxation services in 154 countries with over 64,000 people. Today's webinar, as I've said, is on the Apprenticeship Levy. We've set aside an hour to go through this presentation and we will, f we will aim to finish within the hour. You may be listening in using your computer's speaker system. If you would prefer to join over the phone, please just click the event info tab and use the dial-in information provided. Your lines have all been muted. Apprenticeships are firmly on the agenda and we believe that businesses must make positive choices from a solid knowledge base. The apprenticeship levy will provide commercial edge to many businesses via a positive impact on the bottom line and utilizing government funding up to upskill the workforce whilst providing an enhanced recruitment and retention proposition. BDO are at the forefront of providing comprehensive thought leadership and guidance on the levy to our clients. Our team of education and tax specialists have partnered with two leading experts in this area. Marinos Pathetis, who was the National Executive Director of the Skills Funding Agency and also led on the implementation of the government skills policy and apprenticeship delivery, and Tony Allen, who was Deputy Director of the Large Company Unit at the SFA. Together, we're supporting employers to fully understand the impact the levy will have on them, shape their training strategy for the next three to four years to maximize the benefits, and prepare their existing systems and controls to ensure full compliance with this new tax. I'm delighted to advise that our specialist speakers today are Marinos Pathetis and Sean Healy. As I've just said, Marinos led on the implementation of the government's skills policy and apprenticeship delivery. Nowadays, he's chairman of an independent training provider and a specialist consultant for BDO. He assists our clients with levy impact assessments on their businesses and helping them to shape and implement their levy strategies. Sean is an employment tax principal in our human capital team who has a particular interest in helping organizations to focus on their employment expenditure and operating cost. He has participated in a number of HMRC and CBI consultative committees, including in relation to the apprenticeship levy. In this area, Sean is working to bring his in-depth technical knowledge of the new levy legislation to our clients, so assisting them with this aspect of their levy impact assessments and helping them to shape and implement their levy strategies. Our intention today is to cover and discuss the finance, HR and learning implications of the levy and outline the key steps to consider as part of your strategy. So firstly, we will consider the tax technical and finance implications and then we will discuss the HR and learning issues which you need to consider and address. This will be done by a way of a case study so that we can hopefully bring some of the practical issues our clients are facing to life. Finally, I will summarize our general observations, recommendations and next steps for you to take away and consider as part of your strategy to manage the impact of the apprenticeship levy on your business and maximize the opportunities available to you. You can ask questions of our panelists during the webinar please use the Q&A feature, which is in the right-hand corner of your screen. We'll address as many of the questions as we can live at the end of the webinar, or if time doesn't permit, we'll respond afterwards. We're also recording the webinar and we'll email you a link to the recording in a few days' time. This email will also include a link to a survey asking for your comments on the webinar. Please do complete this, as we can use the feedback to improve our output going forwards. So, over to Sean. Thanks, Steph. This has been uh, quite a journey that the government has taken us on, and the first thing I'd like to say is that we're yet to get to the destination, so there may well be some further changes. There is a consultation live with some of the regulations that we might hear from further, and also as I go through the technical part, I'm going to assume that people have not a great detailed knowledge of the levy and how it might apply. So, first things first, what is this? Well, it's quite clear, despite early comments that this was a levy, um, something that might be optional, it's not. It's straightforward, it's a tax. The 
legislative draftsman has been remarkably brief in how he's described the legislation and as it says there's a lift straight from the act on the slide there that it is a tax and that's the first thing that I'd like to make clear to everybody this is not an option every employer in the UK will be liable for the levy we'll come on to whether that might mean you actually pay some monies over but it is a tax so that means the involvement of HM Revenue and Customs who are going to be the agency that helps mo look at the levy, ensures compliance and also will come out and inspect employers to make sure that they're getting it right. So who precisely does the levy apply to? An employer any employer that is, whether it's an individual or a large multinational company, has something called a pay bill. There is a definition of that which we'll come on to. And if that pay bill is going to be over three million pounds in the current tax year, that means you're going to be liable to pay the levy. There is also some, um, some debate still going on about how precisely that levy will be applied. But if your pay bill, as I've quoted there on the slide, is going to be over 2.8 million in the current year, then you're going to have to register. The government is going to leave it up to an employer to decide whether their pay bill is likely to uh, reach that level. So one of the first things that an employer will need to do is assess the size of their business and how it's going to grow over the next six months to see whether when the levy comes in from 6th of April next year that they are going to be liable. Many of you listening will have pay bills well in excess of that figure already, so clearly that is going to apply to you. So perhaps the next thing to look at is what is a pay bill? How, how do we work out what that is? So the pay bill will come across um, in detail in a moment, but let's have a look at what happens when the revenue collect the money from you. You're going to pay it over and part of your normal PAY monthly remittance, so the first time that will go over will be towards the end of May in 2017. There's not going to be any separate uh, paperwork involved. We're being advised, it's yet to be issued, but we're being advised there'll be an amendment to the monthly submit submissions you make under the real-time information system and pay that over alongside your PAY and national insurance payments. So in that context, that should be relatively straightforward. But as your pay bill fluctuates each month, so the levy you pay will fluctuate. The revenue is acting basically as a collection agency on behalf of what's called the Skills Funding Agency, which already exists and monitors and looks after uh, apprenticeships in the UK. So once that money is paid over, there is a first step there that we need to pause and have a think about. If you're a business that's solely operating in England, all of the money you pay over will go into a, what we call a digital account, a savings pot if you like. And the SFA will put a 10% uplift onto that. So whatever you pay over, another 10% will be added. However, if you have a business that has employees across the UK, or in one of the uh, principalities, Wales, Northern Ireland, etc., the revenue will, based on information that they hold, split the levy fund that you pay over to the devolved governments. So, simply put, if 10% of your workforce operates in Scotland, 10% of what you pay over will not go to the skills funding agency run digital account, it'll go to the Scottish Government. And similarly, if you have employees in Wales, Northern Ireland, the same thing will happen. This is going to be based on the records that the revenue hold presently, and there is some debate about the quality of those records. So one point to make is if you are in that situation, you do need to start engaging with HMRC to see how detailed the records hold, because it's yet to be uh, decided how the Scottish and Welsh governments will use the funding levy. So to be clear, if you're having uh, um, apprentices and employees across the UK, you may only at this juncture be able to spend what goes into your English levy pot. 
So we're hoping that in, in due course we will hear from the Scottish Government, and it's possible they will simply replicate what the Skills Funding Agency is doing in England, but they may choose to go down a very different route. We're yet to see what's going to happen. So I mentioned a moment ago about calculating the pay bill. How does that actually work? If you're one of those organisations that simply pays everybody once a month, has no bonuses, nothing else happens, it's a relatively straightforward exercise. But I've put this slide together to demonstrate the, the other little touch points that organisations will need to think about. Because the way the legislation is drafted, you have to calculate the levy on the pay bill for a particular calendar month. So you may have numbers of different PAY schemes. We were talking to an organisation recently that had 16 different schemes, all operating on different cycles, so weekly, monthly, there are also four weekly payrolls. All of those have got to be pulled together to make sure you can calculate what pay is for apprenticeship levy purposes in that month. You've also got to consider within the organisation things that are called pecuniary liabilities. A simple example of that might be that the organisation pays home telephone bills for employees. Those bills are taxable. They're also liable to Class 1 national insurance, and that's what we need to think about here. Additionally, you may have one-off payments being made in the organisation. For example, elements of a termination payment when people leave your organisation may be liable to national insurance. You need to identify those payments and ensure the details are captured because they're also liable to the apprenticeship levy. Other ideas of one-off payments could be bonuses, could be different parts of the organisation making those payment decisions. You need to have an oversight on those payments to ensure you're able to calculate your levy correctly. Another step to consider is that any benefits that you provide on a non-cash basis, so company cars, private medical insurance, etc., anything that is liable to what we call Class 1A national insurance, and that may be paid through the payroll or at the end of the tax year as part of the P11D process, are not included in the pay bill. So to be clear, the pay bill is items for Class 1 national insurance, not Class 1A, nor if you pay items through a PAY settlement agreement, which are liable to Class 1B national insurance, these are also excluded. Well, we haven't then reached the end. If you have any share or share option related payments in your organisation, some of those are liable to national insurance in certain circumstances. And again, those details need to be captured in the month they are paid that they generate a liability so you're able to calculate the apprenticeship levy on that. And the final step, uh, those of you that have international contacts, if you're sending staff overseas, which still may be liable to UK national insurance, or conversely have expatriate employees working in the UK that fall within a UK national insurance liability, whether or not they can ever receive training is irrelevant. They will be caught under this levy requirement. I'll also not put it down on the slide there, but also just to mention, there is an exemption at the moment for apprentices under 25 that you don't need to pay employers national insurance if they're on a full-time apprenticeship, and as I say, under the age of 25. Those, payment, those salaries are still included in the pay bill for levy purposes. I did have one client ask me whether this, would this be a matter to them because they only employed half a dozen apprentices under the misapprehension that this only applied to apprentices. It doesn't. It applies to all employees. But when you've got through those stages, you've finally got this thing called a pay bill on which you have to calculate your levy. There is, however, a, a further consideration we have to look at what we call the connected company rules. If you're a group, an organisation, looking down from the, if you like, the holding company at the top of the group, you have to look at all the different organisations that you have within your uh, control. So whether you're a charity and devolved in organisations or in the public sector, the same applies. Looking at all the different employers that are within uh, your group, if you have common control of those organisations, and I've put the, the Finance Act and the uh, legislative details for those that need them, but in broad terms, this means that you own 51% of a business, then that means you need to include the pay bill in those organisations in your overall calculation. So it's perfectly possible 
that an organisation may have 10 different companies, each with a pay bill of 2.5 million, who don't think that there's any levy liability. However, if common ownership applies, then the levy is going to apply to all of those organisations. Another uh, thing to consider there is, as you may be aware, there is a £15,000 allowance within the levy uh, legislation that means that every organisation gets this and effectively if your pay bill is below £3 million then you don't pay that allowance. But that allowance is only uh, shared amongst a group so you are able to apportion it but there isn't a £15,000 allowance per employer or per PAY reference, there's one. So again that's another uh, area to consider. Finally on the connection point it's also worth noting that uh, the connection test only applies at the beginning of a tax year. So if your business acquires a smaller business uh, before April 2017, it will fall within the levy. If it acquired it in May 17, then it will only apply to the levy from April 18. So whilst you're not going to consider buying a business or disposing of a business purely for levy, purposes, that's something else that needs to be considered. And indeed, that organisation may already be paying the levy in its own right if its pay bill is sufficiently large. Here we've put together a schematic that takes you through the steps that we've tried to cover there. Um, so I won't dwell on this slide too much, but simply in pictorial form, you have the stages shown there for levy paying employers. Just for reference as well, those non-levy paying employers that fall below the three million can still draw funding from the government. And it's important to note that if you put your money into the levy pot, if you don't spend it within 18 months, then you lose it. It's very much a use it or lose it uh, scenario. If you do lose it or don't spend it on qualifying training, then it's the non-paying levy paying employers that are going to benefit from that. Similarly, on the, on the green line, we're showing how qualifying training providers become involved uh, with the levy. They have to be registered so to ensure they're uh, inspected by the offset. They have quality training to provide. They will offer training to you. And once provided that training, then they're going to draw down funds from your di digital account once you've approved that expenditure. So very much it's a, a three-way uh, involvement with the government uh, through the Department for Education and the Skills Funding Agency controlling the levy, employers funding it, and it being expended on qualifying training providers. And as the finally at the bottom, we've got the government controlling uh, matters, having all the data on training and providing uh, quality assurance on the training providers to meet the government's target of having 3 million apprentices by 2020. So, finally, I just want to point out some of the risks that apply when trying to police and look after the levy. There are significant anti-avoidance provisions within the legislation that are common with a lot of new legislation that we're seeing. For those of you not familiar with these titles, GAAR stands for General Anti-Avoidance Rule. DOTAS is also a detailed uh, a tax avoidance measure that uh, all apply to the apprenticeship levy. So they've changed this legislation to ensure that generally uh, the levy or non-payment or non-compliance of the levy will be caught by all the provisions that already exist. So we have things called uh, accelerated payment notices and follow notices that can apply if you don't pay the levy and also if anybody comes up with uh, a clever idea or they think that's a clever idea to promote tax avoidance around the levy, the specific legislation that, to uh, prevent that. So we have the HMRC inspectors that are going to police the levy alongside PAY and National Insurance and what I imagine will happen is that as they carry out their normal routine employer compliance reviews, they will also look at levy compliance and similarly may look at it when they're looking at national minimum wage compliance as well. For larger organisations, they fall within what's called the senior accounting officer regime. 
And if you're within that regime, there's been some debate about whether apprenticeship levy falls within what we term SAO. Currently, HMRC have advised that it is not the case, uh, and that's what we're working to, and there's been no legislation to uh, change that. But as I said earlier, things will change, and it's possible that it may fall within SAO at a later date. And finally, uh, there are penalties that can apply. I've given again the legislative reference, but again in broad terms, they're the same penalty regime that can apply for non-compliance with PAYE and national insurance. So very much in broad terms, if one thinks of this as another PAY and national insurance matter, then you'll be thinking about along, along the right lines. So finally, as I've alluded to already, the goalposts are still moving. Uh, we've had some uh, legislation drafted and sent out to us uh, as in draft. I think we've got a, a date wrong there, but never mind. It's November 16th is the next month when that closes. And the Department for Education, the Skills Funding Agency, are still finalising their policy. And as we said, effectively, HMRC in practice are still looking into how this is going to work. So what's next? We could have further uh, statements included within the autumn statement, which is November 23rd, or possibly as late as December. And this month, we're expecting the full drafting and eligibility rules from the DFE and the SFA, and hopefully by the new year, have everything buttoned down as to how this will apply. As Steph alluded to earlier, uh, Marinos, one our consultant and I, are now going to have a chat about the case study. So this is where I turn into a little bit of Andrew Marr and introduce Marinos and our case study. Hi, Sean. Good morning. Hello, everybody. I mean, it's a really interesting case study because you've got quite a range of options in that, and, and we do appreciate that's not going to necessarily fit for everyone there. But I think some of the uh, overarching things that we can discuss will apply to you all, and then we can always discuss separately uh, any specifics uh, about your business. But this is quite a big levy pot. Um, we've seen people with 20, 30,000 pound levy pots and, and people with over 10 million. Uh, but some of these uh, same things will apply. So if we, if we run through and then we can uh, perhaps start to uh, define how it's going to work in this particular business. Okay, well we've got it in the case study here. We've got a business with quite a diverse um, set of employees doing very different things. I imagine they probably work in silos, don't really talk to each other, and you may have HR and payroll people working individually in each organization. We often find that that, that is the case. So I suppose just as a, as a starter, um, we put in our case study that there are 150 apprentices in one of the divisions, or two of the divisions, sorry. So what happens to their funding then, Marinos? Well, the funding for any existing apprentices or any apprentices that start up to the end of March 2017 will be funded through the training provider by government in the normal current way, and it will carry on being funded that way right till the end of that apprentices training program. So those apprentices will never touch your levy pot. They will be funded separately. And I think it's fair to say, uh, Sean, you're quite right that in many businesses at the moment, uh, there isn't any overarching attention on this. So quite often, if you had three businesses, there could be apprentices in those businesses that either the holding company don't know about or even within that business they won't know about because they may have a depot in crew where a local training provider has worked with them to take a number of learners. The government funds that money, that money so the employer may not even know. And, and often when, we, when we've spoken to employers, they might say they haven't got any apprentices and you find they've got 50 or 100. In this case, we know they have 150. Those will carry on being funded as will any new starts before end of March. So what you're saying then is, it, in general, it could have training and provision of training could have been quite a devolved activity within a group, lots of local arrangements, and that's probably going to change because I can't imagine all those people are going to be able to authorise payments from the levy account. That's right. I think this is a fundamental change for employers. Up to March next year, the government has paid for this. Quite often, employers haven't contributed anything. They don't know how much the provider can draw down for those individuals. The provider does all the work, and quite often, they've been left to it. That's not in all cases. We get some very good employers who take a very active interest. But there are also situations where the employer is the consumer of apprenticeship training, but they don't act 
as a customer. Now it's going to be their money. It's going to be in a levy pot. The person in crew that might have been able to work with a local training provider to take one young person or to, to, to train an existing employee won't be able to do that without some oversight from whoever you decide as a business is going to look after your levy pot. So this is a fundamental change to, from where we are now, and it very much will put you in the driving seat as to how you want to use your levy, what you want to do with it, and over a number of years, it will really change behaviors because at the moment, quite often employers are just doing what's been offered to them by a training provider, whereas now they need to have a plan, and we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so, so talking about planning, if the organization is thinking about taking on new apprentices, should it do it now? Should it wait till April? What's your view? Well, I've certainly had some employers say to me, well, we haven't got much of a levy pot, so we're not going to do anything at the moment. We're going to stop everything and wait till next April. Do not do that. You need to do what's right for your business. And if, if your current arrangements are being evaluated and they're effective and it's what you need, then please carry on using them. Also, as, as Sean has said, your levy pot will start being filled from May 2017. It may be that where you've got good arrangements that you're happy with, get, get your learners on now. Uh, certainly start what you can start legitimately until uh, up to March because that will give you time to build up your levy pot for other things that you may be doing or for new, new learners. So, yes, yeah, don't just stop, please. Have a think about why you would stop, and, and I think in most cases you wouldn't want to do that. Okay. Well, drilling down into um, the sort of operational divisions, uh, talking about distribution or as logistics, as I like to call it, uh, what sort of apprenticeship opportunities might be available to people in that uh, division? Well, interestingly, uh, currently we have apprenticeship frameworks. They're all changing gradually into new employer-led standards. But logistics is one of those areas in warehousing that's very well served at the moment. You, we have qualifications in, in warehousing, in logistics, in team leading, in leadership and management, and many employers who've got people in very large distribution centers, warehouses, are currently using uh, apprentices very successfully for a group of employees that often left school without a formal qualification, and the apprenticeship gives them a specific qualification in the area that they're training in, whether it be team leading or logistics, warehousing, but it also allows um, the training provider on behalf of the employer to help them with literacy and numeracy or IT as well. So there are some real benefits of helping people who perhaps didn't get any formal qualifications at school or who are moving into team leading supervisory work. Well, that's, that's really helpful and that, that it does demonstrate that this is not just a traditional classroom one day a week type of training that perhaps a lot of us are familiar with. Absolutely not, no. No, this is very much on the job, and most of an apprenticeship will happen on the job. Obviously, if you're teaching somebody uh, numeracy or literacy, you need a quiet area, but quite often that can also be done using technology in their own time, uh, at home, in an exam room, in a meeting room. But generally, it's done on the job, and a lot of the observation obviously will be as people work. Okay, so it's not the traditional classroom learning. There are numerous styles of learning that can be adapted to meet the standard to also meet the operational requirements of an organization. Absolutely, and it might include tests and exams, but it would also include professional discussions. It would include observations over a lengthy period where the assessor will be able to give feedback to the individual, and it will include projects where they can go and research in their own time and, and bring back the answers. So it's a real mix of activity, including some teaching where they need uh, specialist skills or, or they need numeracy or literacy because they didn't get the GCSE at grade A to C at school. Okay, so just thinking about the sort of age profile of the workforce a little bit here, we've talked about um, people that perhaps didn't uh, get what they needed from, from schooling. Are there any particular things that we should just uh, think about for, say, staff in the age group 16 to 18 or, and then latterly the age group 18 to 25? Well, certainly for the 16 to 18 year olds, and they are a big priority for government and remain a priority for government, we, we know that many young people of that age are staying on at school, but when they leave school, they have to be involved in some structured training. They might be at the College of Further Education or they'll be on an apprenticeship program. And it's very important that they're doing something to continue their studies. For those young people, the government uh, will in the future uh, enhance the, 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 the payments by a thousand pounds for the training provider.
provider and £1,000 for you, the employer, every time you recruit a 16 to 18 year old. And that's because we know 16 to 18 year olds have additional needs. They're not going to be job ready straight away and you're obviously going to pay them a lower amount anyway, but also there's some additional support for you. For the 19 to 24 year olds, um, they may also need some additional help and support and the, the, the benefit to the employer there is that we know that they won't be paying any national insurance contributions and that's a significant amount of money, I think you know, not just under 14%, Correct, yeah. so a large amount of money. So if you've got apprentices now, right now, then you need to check that you're actually getting uh, that national insurance back and if you're not, make arrangements to discuss it with your training provider, get the evidence and do that and then going forward, everybody you recruit or you put on the program from your current workforce will, will have that saving as well. So quite a significant saving. So, so just to be clear there, if an organisation has uh, current employees that are not uh, under an apprenticeship training programme, would we need to call them apprentices to, to uh, benefit from that NIC exemption or, or is it just that they have to have a proper qualifying training course yeah. and sign up to a proper apprenticeship? They have to be on a bona fide apprenticeship program with an approved training provider. If they're called a warehouse operative or a retail manager, that's what they can carry on being called. You know, okay. that, that's, that's not a problem. Obviously, young people coming into a business often know that they're coming into an apprenticeship because it's advertised as an apprenticeship, and that's great, and they know they're going to get quality structured training, or they certainly should do. But for your existing workforce, whatever their title is, you go with that. Okay, and, and therefore they, they could earn the same salary, have the same terms and conditions other than uh, doing additionally uh, an apprentice training program. Yeah. So just touching on... Um, we're going to be drawing down uh, monies from the levy pot for training. Can we spend that on infrastructure? Can we spend, what can we spend it on and what can't we spend it you on? You can only spend it with an approved training provider for the apprenticeship and what's in the standard. Okay. You can't spend it on their salary, their travel, uh, or, or any work that you might be doing with them outside the apprenticeship in terms of development. It has to be on a bona fide apprenticeship. That, that, now that's not to say that that's not going to suit you because it could be that you will be able to map existing activity that you do in your workplace to a new or emerging standard and we'll get more and more standards you know, as, as the months and years go on. Okay. So you're not going to hit, get one single hit on this. So this particular business, they may carry on with their 150 learners, they may carry on with warehousing and uh, manufacturing, but soon they could be doing team leading, leadership and management, they could be looking at their professionals in the business and, and looking at AAT or SEMA, they could be looking at marketing qualifications. So you need to have a plan. You need to have a plan and, and, and build on it as the new standards and your capacity and, and the providers that you bring on board can deliver for you. So what sort of, you mentioned a plan, what sort of time scale do you think a plan should be over? I think it's very important that you have at least a three year plan with, with year, one, year one being really all about uh, choosing your, your training providers. You may have one or two, you may have three or four, you may have uh, one main, main provider that you know and trust and a number of others, particularly if you're going to be offering accounting or marketing, you will need a specialist provider. If you're offering degree apprenticeships in the future, you will need a university. But if you have at least one really good trusted provider who will support you, uh, and, and a company this size could have two or three, um, they will help you through most of this. I think it's quite important to say that at this size, you also want to consider your options about whether you might want to be a training provider. Uh, and many employers, Sean, ask us, should we become a training provider? If they're at a million and a half like this, you'd at least think about it. I, I think it's a very serious thing to think about and it's not something you rush into. There, there, there is guidance on the, on the SFA website about what a, an employer provider would do. But just, try, just remember, if you are going to seriously look at that route, Ofsted will come calling, they will inspect you. Uh, it can be very difficult if you haven't got the infrastructure because you may be very good at manufacturing or selling but you're not a training provider. Uh, and the other thing you need to bear in mind is the, the amount of back office paperwork and, and, and audit requirements. So something we'd have to think about and talk to you about it uh, and I, I don't think that's the first first port of call. Okay, but just to be clear then, that's an option that is available for businesses but they would be under the same regime as existing training organisations as a qualifying training that's, provider. That's exactly right. So okay. look at your plan, think about it, speak to your training providers if you've got them, speak to professionals. Tony and myself are always very happy to talk to, to BDO clients um, and, and take it forward for there. But I would say have a three-year plan, 
leave complex things that may not be available yet, graduate training, other stuff that you're not used to doing, perhaps into year two and three, mm -hmm. and build on having the right providers and, uh, and, and training the workforce that you've currently um, got in place. Okay, so that's talked about sort of distribution and we've already got apprentices in, in manage, manufacturing. I'd, I'd be surprised if you can get an apprentice in a retail environment. Well, you know, surely you can't take staff off a shop floor for a, one day a week. I mean, how's that going to work? Well, actually, actually, there are thousands and thousands of retail apprentices, and you can. Now, a lot of it is done on the job, uh, and an assessor from a training provider may be there for half a day, and a lot of that will be observing. Some of that will be structured discussion. Some of that will be discussion with a manager. Generally, you try and keep people in the workplace. As I said earlier, if it's a small shop, that can be quite difficult with some things. So, for instance, you're not going to teach somebody numeracy in a shop, uh, but if they need that, that will already be agreed in advance. The manager will know. The assessor will plan a, a, vi a visit at least a month in advance. So everything is organized to, to cause the minimum disruption that business. So businesses I currently work with, for instance, in retail, we don't go at all in December. Okay. Because that would just not be feasible. But they often have a quiet time in January when you can catch up with that. But it's very much work-based, this, and clearly there is a lot of learning, and some of it will be done in the learner's own time, and you do need the understanding from the learner and the manager that there will be a commitment, and there will be a significant commitment from the learner uh, in their own time. Because at the end of this, they will end up with a diploma and some certificates, uh, and at least at university entrance, obviously, or beyond, and increasingly we're doing apprenticeships in level three, four, five, and beyond. So quite a serious commitment, so I wouldn't want to understate that, but I don't think in retail it should actually jeopardize the running of the store, especially where you've only got three or four team members. So, so to play that back to you as a, a non-training specialist, what, what I'm hearing is that it's definitely workable. There is a requirement, I believe, that to to for it to be a qualifying course, that 20% of the of the length of the training course um, is is going to be required for training. But we can do that. It doesn't necessarily need to be one day a week. It'd be just over the length of the course. Absolutely, and that includes the time that the, the assessor is preparing work for them, observing them, putting into practice what they've learned because it's a learning environment, uh, and all those things count. And, and we've got tried and tested ways of making sure that we meet that quality threshold, uh, and there are many grade one outstanding providers who do that really, really well, uh, and others uh, good okay. providers. Um, obviously, it's our case study, so we, we put that into to see, but if they have got retail staff in, in Wales and Scotland, from a practical perspective, what do you think is going to happen about drawing down levy from the Scottish and Welsh governments? Okay, well, as you said earlier, Sean, I don't think we're clear as to what they're going to do, but it may be that they won't replicate the levy process uh, the money that you pay over will go to the Welsh and Northern Ireland or Scottish governments, and it will go to them in the proportion of the workforce pay, not the numbers of employees that you've got. So if you've got 15% of your employees based in those countries, living in those countries, it won't be 15% of your, your, your levy pot. It will be the proportion that's their wages. So that's important to know because you may have all your directors in London and all your bonus schemes in London. But having said that, that money will go to those governments and they will operate their own apprenticeship arrangements. And what you can do is that you can speak to your training provider and work through whether they operate in Scotland or Wales and Ireland, and if they don't, whether they can make reciprocal arrangements in those countries because they all have bona fide apprenticeship programs. The only difference is, not coming out of your levy pot, you're not quite the customer in the way that you are here because the government in those countries will pay the money to the provider, not you, and that's a significant difference. But I wouldn't be put off if you want to have a universal program across your business and you have many people in Wales and Scotland, uh, then discuss it with a training provider to start with, and obviously the skills funding agency will be making arrangements uh, more visible. At the moment, you know, I think there is a chance they will carry on running their own current arrangements in those countries, but, but that still means the availability of apprenticeships. Good, good. Um, so just one final point on that, uh, you alluded to it. So how, how is it decided uh, where somebody, we know HMRC have got records of where people live, and obviously they know where they, well, they know which payroll they're on, but they don't know where they physically work. How is that going to be based, do you think? Have, is it going to be where they do the training, where they live personally, or where they work? Well, interestingly, on, on current arrangements, if somebody works or lives in England, uh, then the training provider in England can train that person 
uh, even if they go home to Wales at night. Right, uh, OK. I think with the levy, we know it's going to be where you live that HMRC, HMRC will use to actually take the money away and, and pass it to. So if you live in Wales, uh, your funding will go over there. So the employer may well have to decide whether they want to use those arrangements. Uh, but if they actually work in England, I think there'll be some flexibility. You know, I doubt somebody will say, you know, you're coming to work every day in England, but you can't be on that program. But if they actually live and work in Scotland, then definitely, for sure, it will be those arrangements in the other country. Okay, Marinos, thanks for that. I'm going to pass back to Steph now for some general observations before we go into our Q&A. Well, thanks very much to both of you. That was really informative. And I'm sure this will give, be giving a lot of people lots to think about. We've actually had quite a few queries through already, um, some of which I think you've answered in part, so we might just come back just to close some things down at the end. Um, but before I move on to the general observations, can I just remind anybody who has joined our webinar today that if you do have questions for our panelists which you haven't already submitted, please do now submit them. The Q&A feature is in the right-hand corner of your screen. So for me, there's some key messages which have come out of Sean and Marinos' sections, and perhaps the most important of which is that the apprenticeship levy is firmly on the agenda and it's enshrined in legislation, albeit that there might be a few tweaks around the edges. So from everything we're currently hearing from the HMRC policy leads and also from the Department for Education, the go-live date will remain as 6 April 2017 and the first payment will be made under your RTI PAYE in the normal way in May 2017, which is in relation to your April pay bill. So given that's, this, that's the case, as you've heard, we would absolutely recommend that businesses make sure that your internal finance and HR teams both understand the impact of the levy on your businesses and also look for the positives to make sure that you maximize the benefits We've only got six months until the start date, which is a really short time, so there's a need to prioritize. For example, um, finance are going to want to consider the compliance implications and ensure that you're ready. So are there connected parties? Will the payroll software provider be ready in time? Are your existing systems sufficient to ensure that everything which qualifies as pay bill will reach your payroll team and be included in the monthly reporting? Who's going to be responsible for setting up and monitoring the digital levy account? That's an asset to the business. Will that sit under finance or will it sit under HR? HR and training, or L&D, are going to be keen to consider the current recruitment and training strategies to understand what changes need to be made going forward once your business is a true buyer of apprenticeship training. There's going to be a runoff period for those who are already on existing apprenticeship contracts, but it's important to shape your three to four year strategy to maximize the benefits. So remember that there's an 18-month use it or lose it period. So do you fully appreciate what opportunities are available to use the funds in your digital levy account to train your existing workforce? Who will be your core training provider in England or will you have more than one? Who will manage these relationships and negotiate terms with the training providers? These are just some of the questions which we are helping clients to consider as part of their readiness program for the apprenticeship levy. So if I look now to some of the questions which have come through during the webinar, there are actually quite a number. So if we don't get to yours, please be assured that after the event, we will come back to you separately. We do have everybody's um, email address, so we will help you with that. So the first one which I've got here, Sean, is probably one for you. Um, it's, we're a large construction business and currently pay the CITB levy. Will we need to pay both? That's an easy one. The short answer is yes. Uh, the CITB is currently working with the government to uh, transition to the new scheme, but certainly for uh, tax year 17-18, an organisation will pay both the CITB levy and the apprenticeship levy, and then hopefully by April 18, something will be worked through to uh, sort that out. There will be other levy boards that this applies to, but CITB is, is leading the fight on that one. Thank you, Sean. Um, Marinos, one for you now. Um, so you said that uh, employers can only use the levy digital account monies for apprenticeship training and nothing else. 
So this business has quite specific training requirements. Is it possible for them to agree a bespoke apprenticeship standard with the SFA? Well, it's, it is possible for employers to do that. Generally, you need to get a group of employers together, so no one employer can drive a, a new standard. But if you know other employers who have got similar uh, needs, then you can get 10 of you together and you can work on establishing a standard which you can then put to the agency for approval. So it is possible, and we've, also, we've already got, if you go on the website and have a look at the, the approved standards or the standards yet waiting approval, you will find a real wide range of opportunities there already. And if you find one that isn't there, then let's talk about it and maybe we can find nine other employers. I should just correct something Steph I said earlier. The, uh, as Sean mentioned, that you'll, you'll be populating your levy pot from April, so the money will go in in May. So actually, if you recruit anybody in April, you won't have any money there. So you will be able to use the current system, in fact, till the 30th of April, not till the end of March. So I just wanted to correct that. Thank you, Marinos. Um, so, Sean, one for you. I can't promise that they will all be alternate. Um, so, this um, company, they say they're a part of a large group of companies, but they want to manage their own levy funds. Will they be able to have their own digital levy account? Yes. Nice and simple. <laughs> uh, so, just, just to add to that, to the answer there, so absolutely, as, as a group of companies, you can have one per payroll reference or you can just have one overall or you can split it exactly as you wish to happen. Um, it's up to you to open your digital levy account though and I believe that that's from next January. January, yeah. There we go. Uh, so Marinos, there's a question, can, can employers put existing employees into approved apprenticeships from next April, May? And if they do, do they all have to be under 25? Right. Employers can put existing employees onto apprenticeships right now and, and have always been able to. Quite often people think it's for new recruits, but it's not. It's for new recruits, it's for young recruits, but it's actually for existing employees. So in many industries, people will actually, employers will have somebody on their books for three or six months anyway before they put them on an apprenticeship because often, especially at the uh, lower qualification levels, you want to make sure that person is staying before you commit to a year or 18 months apprenticeship program. So yes, you can, and um, it, it does not revolve around 16-year-olds or 18-year-olds or 24-year-olds. You can have people of any age in an apprenticeship, but current funding, it's very much skewed to younger workers because that's been the government priority. So a young person attracts uh, a much greater level of funding than a 25-year-old. That's going to change going forward with the standards because we're going to have standard rates which will apply to everybody, which will actually um, be difficult for some providers, but that's the way we're going. But you will have the thousand pounds extra if they're 16 to 18. That's really helpful, thank you. Uh, Sean, this is um, uh, sort of quite a simple question at one and one piece. So what's the expected levy percentage that will be charged? Well, at the moment, uh, it's 0.05%, point, point but, you know, we've yet to see uh, what Mr. Hammond will say when he stands up on the 23rd. It could change, uh, but that's what we've been working on at the moment. Thank you. Um, and Marinos, there's a question here. If, if the employer's pay bill is under three million, how can they access apprenticeship training funds from the government because they won't have any money in their levy account because they won't be paying the levy? No, they won't be paying the levy and they won't have a digital vault, although eventually in the future they will have. But they can access it through the government funding which is available through approved training providers. So you can look at the SFA site and then the future apprenticeship organization will have a list of approved providers. So you'll be able to have a look at uh, what those providers offer, where they're based, what, what sort of quality success rates, what their offset rating is, you'll be able to choose a provider and then what will happen is that uh, against an agreed government funding rate and there will be agreed rates across all these different standards that I've mentioned, you will have to contribute 10% of the funding that, that you agree with the provider. So if you agree with the provider that this, this qualification is £4,000 and that's, and that's below the government maximum level, then the government will pay 
3,600 and you'll pay 400 pounds, you'll have to pay that up front or commit to pay that up front. So you won't be able to get apprenticeships for free, but uh, there, there is some uh, leeway there for very small businesses taking 16 to 18 year olds. So for the rest of you, it's 10%. That's really helpful, thank you. And in terms of um, the funding which comes from the government for the 90%, will, will that have to be paid up front by the employer to claim back, or will the government just pay the training provider directly? The 90% the, the will be paid for by the government over the, the period of the training. So most of it will be paid monthly. So if the program is 12 months, most of it will be paid in monthly installments. But there will be an element left behind to pay for a successful completion, and there'll also be an element of money kept back for completely independent assessments at the end, because in the future, the training provider that does the training will not be able to assess their work, so you will have independent assessment, and that needs to be paid for. So some money gets kept back, your 10% gets paid to the provider, and that can be paid up front at the beginning, or, or there may be some scope to, to pay that early on, but not not all in one go. So my cash flow is only that 10%, so yes, I don't have to worry about no, the rest. No, you don't. That and uh, I should just add that for those of you who are marginal with a levy, who may only have 50 or 60,000 pounds and you may run out, uh, if you do run out of your levy, then obviously you can speak to your training providers because they may well be able to draw down government funding and you pay the 10% in cash, not from your levy pot. That's great, thank you. Um, we clearly have got several people um, who have dialed in who operate across the whole of the UK. And I think to summarize all of the questions as best I can into one, in the devolved areas, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, so will the current rules continue to apply until or unless those governments decide that they want to mirror the new English system? Yes, they definitely will. And as Sean and I have said, we, we don't know, but they may well prefer to carry on with their current arrangements, or they may well want to have a look at mirroring the English levy system. We don't know that. Uh, but if they carry on as they are, then you will have to access that funding in the old way through a training provider, and, and it won't come out of any levy pot that you've got. Thank you. Um, and I think the final question that we're going to have time for um, but like I say, we will come back to all questions after the event. So Marinos, I think this is another one for you, I'm afraid. Um, so this company wants to give all of the UK employees the same training. So how are they going to do that post next April, May, once you know, Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland have got different rules and regulations? Well, I already work with, with large employers who do that under the current arrangements, and, and it's highly possible. So you, you need to have a discussion with your training provider offering that occupational area and discuss what your needs are. So if 90% of your workforce uh, doing that particular qualification, let's say retail management, uh, if they're all doing that uh, in England, then you will use your levy pot uh, or currently government funding. For the others, you may well be able to either negotiate reciprocal arrangements for those people in Scotland and, and, and Wales and Northern Ireland, or you may well be able to agree with your training provider that there will be a similar program delivered to those people, but there will be no funding drawn down. Uh, I have one client who happily pays for the diploma element privately so that the people in Scotland get the diploma, but they're not on an apprenticeship program. There are just lots of ways that you can work this through, but I wouldn't give up on it. You certainly do want to be able to offer the same program across all your workforce. That's great. Thank you very much. So this brings to the, us to the end of the webinar. So thank you to both Marinos Pafitas and Sean Healy for your insight. It's very much appreciated this morning. We have had an awful lot of questions come through, but if you do have any others, please do contact us. We have a, an app levy um, email address, which is displayed on your screen now, so you can continue to put questions through to us. Once you leave today's webinar, You'll also receive a survey asking for your feedback. So if you can spare the time, please do complete it, as it helps us to ensure you're providing the content that you want. And you'll also receive a follow-up email in the next couple of days with a link to view a recording of today's seminar. So thank you again. Apologies if we haven't got to your particular question. We will come to you after the event. So on behalf of BDO and our presenters today, thank you for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>